uh, welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone had their tea or coffee break. Yeah, you are allowed both, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Maria Jyoti, for a great introduction and actually a lovely meditation. So it was a lovely start to the evening. Uh, and I just hope I can live up to your billing, really. So after Padma Vajra last week, who knows? Um, so to begin with, uh, I'm going to talk about towards towards a dana economy. But what I'd like to start with is just quoting from the text on the website that actually introduces the whole of this series that we're having on dana. Um, so I think it's just a very good summary. So it says, "It is in no doubt that we're living in unprecedented times." One of the most startling features of this pandemic has been the incredible generosity it has generated among people, manifesting in ways both big and small. In almost all Buddhist traditions, generosity, or dana, is seen as being the fundamental virtue for a person to develop. But how far does our imaginative connection with generosity extend? Do we really have an inspiring vision of how tra transformative generosity in practice can be? So that's introducing the series. And I just believe that there is an inspiring vision based on the principles of generosity and their power to transform. And that is the dharma economy. And so that's this evening I'm going to be exploring what moving towards a dharma economy might look like. But first of all, what I'm going to do is just explore what exactly is dana. Um, well, the usual translation of the word dana is generosity, or perhaps more accurately, giving. But there is so much more to it than that. As Sangharachita says, in a sense, dana, or giving, is the basic Buddhist virtue, without which you can hardly call yourself a Buddhist. Dana consists not so much in the act of giving as in the feeling of wanting to give, of wanting to share what you have with other people. This feeling of wanting to give or share is often the first manifestation of the spiritual life. So strong stuff. But the Buddhist tradition has always emphasized the importance of Dana in the spiritual life. So I've got three examples. Firstly, dana is one of the six paramitas, one of the six perfections of the bodhisattva, the noble qualities of character associated with enlightened beings. So the essence of this paramita, dana, is said to be a boundless openness of heart and mind, a selfless generosity and giving, which is completely free from attachment and expectation. From the depths of our heart, we practice generously offering compassion, time, energy, and resources to serve the welfare of all being. Dana is also one of the four Sangha Ravastus which is spoken of in terms of the four means of unifying the Sangha. So the four Sangha Ravastus tell us that generosity, first one, kindly speech, beneficial activity, and exemplification are all key ways to communicate the values and principles of Buddhism, and in that way to contribute to the creation of a Sangha. And we've all experienced the benefits of our own spiritual community, our own Sangha. And we understand the need for spiritual community in the world. And so as our hearts respond to this experience, we naturally want to establish friendly contact with as many people as possible. We want to actually create spiritual friendship. We want to create Sangha. And the third uh, mention of dana that I want to talk about is that, of course, dana is one of the five precepts, those ethical training principles that we're trying to practice and aspire to. So with open-minded generosity, I purify my body. 
because by practicing generosity, by giving, we are giving to others. We're sharing what we have with other people. And by do doing so, we are breaking down those barriers that separate our own tight sense of self from the rest of the world. Sadhana is an integral part of our spiritual life. And it's also a vital part of how we operate as a Sangha, as a spiritual community. So as Sangha Rajita states in Living Ethically, firstly, giving or generosity is the way in which we connect in the most practical manner with others. We let go of our tight grip on what belongs to us, whether material goods, money, time or energy. But above all, we give the Dharma. We don't distinguish between our personal practice of the Dharma and our communication of it to others. So how can Dharma manifest in our Sangha, in our spiritual community? Well, let's just imagine. Imagine building a thriving Buddhist community based on generosity, acting as creators, not consumers, creating a Buddhist center that shares the Dharma for the benefit of the world, where the Sangha works together with a shared purpose. Or imagine a culture of give what you can, take what you need. A Buddhist center based on generosity, where we give what we can afford for the benefit of others. A thriving community working together to spread the Dharma, free of charge. Imagine a Buddhist center that is open to all, regardless of their ability to pay, where people who can afford to give freely for the benefit of those less fortunate, supporting the growth of the center as it reaches out to the wider community. Can you imagine a different world? A world based on generosity, where we give what we can for the benefit of others, where we openly share the Dharma, something that the world desperately needs at the moment. Well, that is the Dharma economy, and we can be that world. So that is the vision, a Buddhist center that is open to all, regardless of their ability to pay. But what does that mean in practice? Well, our meditation teachers and our Dharma teachers have always made their time a gift. No one's paid for teaching. And as, as a, as has everyone who has supported our many classes. Whether online or face to face, from now on, we want our meditation and Buddhism classes to always be without charge. We want to offer as a gift all our meditation and Buddhist, Buddhism courses and retreats. And we want everyone who comes to our center to feel empowered to give themselves, to be part of something radical, a community that gives to the world and to one another without expecting anything in return. So beyond consumerism, we can be creators of this different world based on a model so different from our usual transactional society. And we want, you to, we want to invite all of you to see yourselves as part of this community, seeking to transform our world and contributing in whatever ways you can. So based on that compelling vision, I hope you think it's compelling, the council that helps to run the Buddhist Centre that Virya Jyoti mentioned before, are now exploring transitioning to a dharma economy at the Cambridge Buddhist Centre. And other Buddhist centres and retreat centres within Sri Ratna have already made that move, are already operating on a similar basis, relying on donations for some or all of their activities rather than charging for them. So we've reached out for their advice and support 
And so far we've had really good conversations with people in Sheffield, Birmingham, Glasgow, Bristol, and also a lot of advice from the Future Dharma Fund. And excitingly, all felt that transitioning to a Dharma economy was a move well worth making, even though they recognise there are several challenges to be aware of. So, for instance, according to Sama Chitta, who was chair of Bir Birmingham Buddhist Centre when she spoke about the Dharma economy in 2015, she said, since 2008, 2009, our class income has risen by almost 50%. And over the past five years, the number of new people coming, coming along to our centre has more than doubled. One reason must be the explicit message that there is no charge for our classes. Very inspiring stuff. And we got that from a lot of the centres running the Dharma economy. But what was also clear is that there is no one size fits all method and different centres have different approaches depending on their financial needs, the building constraints, course content, how they operate their courses, the demographics of their Sangha and the, the area they live in, and the culture of the Buddhist centre. So all those can be subtly different, but the main principle of a Dharma economy was common, and that is that as far as possible, all core Buddhist activities are free of charge, with the financing of the centre based principally on donations. So in our case, this wouldn't include more secular activities, such as yoga, tai chi, or the MBSR courses, because there are financial implications for the teachers providing those courses as part of their livelihood. But it would include all Dharma classes, or drop in meditation sessions, and of course, Sangha night. Because we believe that we are trying to create a Buddhist community. Because if we do believe that, then we shouldn't charge people to be part of it. Equally, we should provide the Dharma because we believe in its benefit to the world, not because we need to generate funds for the center. And as such, we shouldn't really charge for courses as if we were an adult education business. We want to welcome strangers into our center and be open to all, regardless of their financial situation. We want to practice hospitality, which is another word for friendliness. Hospitality is a basic level of generosity. It is a foundation for the spiritual life. Hospitality teaches us to look beyond ourselves the needs of others and it encourages us to kindly welcome strangers into our space. This is an exciting vision that speaks to our Dharma lives and values. It is, as I've said it is so different to usual society behaviour. To get as much as you can for the smallest cost type of attitude. But having said that we also need to acknowledge the centre needs money to operate. Indeed, part of the Dharma economy vision is the desire to grow and provide the Dharma to as many people in society as we can. And the good news is that we've done some provisional investigation and the move to a Dharma economy appears feasible at the Cambridge Buddhist Centre. And of course, to a large extent, we're already running a Dharma economy. Since the COVID crisis, we're not charging for our online classes, for instance. We're just asking for donations for the people that come. And if it wasn't for the generosity of all of you, all of the Sangha donating to the centre, we would be in serious financial trouble now. But instead, we're in a fairly sound position due to everybody's dharma. So we are, to a certain degree, already there. What we want to do is have a Dharma economy where the centre is primarily funded by contributions from the Sangha rather than, rather than depending on newcomers to fund the centre. So we're hoping to establish a clear distinction that can be made between the Sangha, who feel a strong connection to the centre and really want to support it, and newcomers, where the emphasis 
shouldn't be on finance, but should be on enabling their engagement. And as such, we would look to increase standing orders from Sangha members based on the value they think they perceive from the centre and their commitment to supporting the centre. And this is because we believe the dharma economy should be based on people who have already benefited from the dharma, providing funds that will support newcomers to experience Buddhism without any financial obstacles. Just to be clear, the request for donations on courses would also be part of the dharma economy, but the centre wouldn't be reliant on those funds for their core activities. It should be made clear that these courses are genuinely provided free of charge and no one should feel put off from attending the Buddhist Centre because of a lack of money. There are many benefits to such a move towards a dharma economy, many of which I've already alluded to. But one is a change of culture. Such a vision can dramatically energise the Sangha as we all become part of building a community, as we all start acting as creators, not consumers. By building a community based on generosity, we will all feel ownership of the vision to provide the Dharma for the benefit of the world, developing a culture of positive engagement and providing the opportunity to create a strong sense of community and shared purpose. The culture can be moved from one of expecting the centre team to provide for the Sangha to one of the Sangha helping to create the environment, helping to create the community. To paraphrase a famous quote very slightly, ask not what your centre can do for you, ask what you can do for your centre. This could include greater participation of people on course teams, a range of opportunities to volunteer, and greater involvement in a wider variety of activity. Secondly, the transition to a dharma economy could have a significant impact on the demographic attending the centre, as well as the supporting the current sangha, which is to a large extent well-educated, white, middle-class, affluent, older people. Not that there's anything wrong with that, by the way. We're likely to attract a younger, poorer, more ethnically diverse population, many of whom may be put off from attending due to financial constraints. Additionally, the number of people attending the, the centre could grow significantly, as happened at Birmingham and other centres. And there's great enthusiasm within our council for using the Dharma economy to grow the centre and to provide the Dharma more widely. And the move to a dharma economy could really help us reach out to a wider community. And excitingly, the Buddhist centre can become a beacon of hope for the world, as it already is in many, many respects. Padma Vajra touched on this last week in his excellent talk, where he used one of Sangharachita's poems called Four Gifts to highlight the generosity of Bhante in establishing our Tree Ratna movement as something we can offer the world. In particular, he drew attention to the image from Bante's poem of his fourth gift, a garden in the wilderness, a place where we can come together in a spirit of friendliness and support, free of the burdens, fears and worries of the everyday world, where we can all flourish and help each other to reach our full potential. This can be our Buddhist centre. So you may want to ask yourself the question at the end of Bante's poem. Could you work in this garden? Because the gifts Bante has given us require a response, to take responsibility both for ourselves and our spiritual community. A move to a dharma economy would provide us with all increased opportunities to engage in such a vibrant community. However, we should also recognise that with any significant change, there are challenges. One major challenge with moving to a dharma economy and changing the culture of the centre 
is to make sure that what makes the current Sangha so strong is not damaged by the move, even as we recognize all the positive benefits of such a transformation. So there are many questions that we still need to look at in more detail. For instance, what do we really charge for, if anything, or can we go completely free of charge? Will people who uh, aren't paying for courses actually commit to those courses? Will they believe in them? What could this move mean for our booking system? Is there changes that could be made there? How exactly do we ask for donations without putting pressure on people and making it seem like it's just a subtle way of charging for courses? But these are all challenges that we can and to a certain degree should face. For instance, one of the other centres that have moved said, when we moved fully to the Dana economy, we realised that we would have to keep asking for donations. At all our classes for newcomers and regulars, we make an appeal in the tea break. On study nights, every so often, we ask for standing orders. Asking for money, whether at classes or in seeking standing orders, is a spiritual practice in itself. And it reminds us all of the importance and beauty of dana as a way of relating to others. So there's bound to be nervousness that we're going to need to address. Change will always create a feeling of unease. And to that end, we would like to hear from you to understand what excites you about such a proposal, but also what concerns you may have. Because for this to work, we will need everyone to share and believe in the vision that I've just outlined. And so to end, I'd like to return to a vision, one that is described in the Vimalakirti Nadesha, that of building a Buddha land, a place with a shared spiritual aspiration to reach enlightenment that will be a force for good in the world. So I think this is what the Cambridge Buddhist Centre can become. Indeed, is a long way to becoming already. But even a Bodhisattva cannot create a Buddha land on his own. As Sangharajita says in The Inconceivable Emancipation, his commentary on the Vimalakirti Nadesha, the Buddha land has to be a joint creation. It has to be built by a number of people working together, inspired by the same ideal. Building a Buddha land within our troubled society is a truly wonderful aspiration. And a strong basis for this is dana, especially as one of the four Sangharavastus, the ways in which a bodhisattva forms a group of people united by their common aim of practicing the dharma. In this context, dana is a means of establishing positive contact between people of creating spiritual friendship, of helping to form a spiritual community. And that is what the Dharma economy is. Helping to build a thriving Buddhist community based on generosity. So that is the end of my talk. Um, as I've said, just said, for a Dharma economy to succeed, we need to have a shared vision with everyone committed to making it happen. As you can probably tell, I'm very excited about this, but we haven't decided what to do yet. We're still investigating it as part of the council and the council is still working through the details. But more importantly, we want the Sangha, you guys, to be behind the change. We want you all to be engaged in this move. And so we'd really like to know what you, the Sangha, think about such a thing, about a Dharma economy. So as Vera Jyoti said beforehand, before the tea break, we are now going to break into groups. And it'd be great if you could reflect on the following questions. So I've got three for you, which uh, I think I'm going to try and put in the chat, but they're also your team leads know them. Uh, the first is, what is your reaction to a Dharma economy? What is your honest response to this vision that I've just outlined? So that's the first question. 
The second question is just, just to reflect on how have you benefited from the Buddhist center in your spiritual life? And how could you contribute to the center so that others can share in these benefits as well? And the third, which is slightly more negative or more challenging, but do you see any issues with introducing the dharma economy in Cambridge Buddhist Centre? So I'll say those once again, but as I say, your team leads have them. What is your reaction to a dharma economy? How have you benefited from the Buddhist Centre? And how could you contribute so that others can share in these benefits? And do you see any issues or challenges with introducing the Dharma economy in Cambridge? So please discuss those in your groups. And then if anything arises, we have got a question and answer session. But also, if you'd like to share any thoughts or issues or concerns or inspirations with the council, then we'd be very, very keen to hear from you. So please get in touch, either by speaking with one of the council me members. So that's, uh, I'm gonna forget someone now, but it's um, uh, myself, Viria Jyoti, Vidya Saki, Arta Siddhi, Arta Priya, Samudra Gosha. Uh, Sangana. Sangana, <laughs> I knew I should get one. <laughs> Kamala Mati. Kamala Mati. And Kamala Mati, so I forgot. Kamala no, Diamond Arthur isn't one of the council members, so at least that was okay. So sorry about that. So you could talk to one of us or, or you could email the centre. So using info at Cambridge Buddhist Centre. Uh, and then if you just put Dharma Economy in the subject field so that we can um, pull that out, then, then we can share that with the council. So two ways of getting that back. But we are going to come back at around about nine o'clock. So in about 20 minutes time and there'll be 20, 10 minutes or so for a question and answer session so we can explore anything that arises during the groups.